خلافتنا بنا سور فتية عظيم شأنها بين البرية السلام عليكم and welcome to a new episode of Beacon of Guidance. Beacon of Guidance is a compilation of questions and answers given by our beloved Hazur, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, may Allah be his helper. These are from various virtual mulakats and compiled letters from Ahmadis all over the world. We have two segments to this program. During the first segment, we'll show you answers which Hazur has given at various virtual mulakats. And in the second segment, we'll show replies to letters which beloved Hazur has given in response to various questions from across the world. Let's now turn to Norway for our first question. On the 4th of December 2021, beloved Hazur blessed the National Amla of Norway with a virtual mulakat. His Holiness was asked, what can we do to keep our children attached to the Jamaat? Let's take a look. سوال یہ ہے کہ حضور جائزہ لیا گیا ہے کہ جب تک بچے پندرہ سال کی عمر کو آتے ہیں اس وقت تک ان کا معیار اور ان کی تربیت میں بہت اچھی ہوتی ہے اور وہ دیکھا جاتا ہے کہ والدین بھی بہت محنت کرتے ہیں ان کے ساتھ لیکن جیسے جیسے وہ خاطر کی عمر میں جاتے ہیں اور آپ بڑے ہونا شروع ہو جاتے ہیں ان کا رابطہ بھی جماعت سے کم ہونا شروع ہو جاتا ہے اور وہ آہستہ آہستہ پیچھے ہٹنا شروع ہو جاتے ہیں ان کا نصاب کا معیار بھی کم ہونا شروع ہو جاتا ہے تو والدین سے بات کرتے ہیں تو والدین کہتے ہیں کہ بچے اب ہماری بات نہیں سنتے یا ہمارے بات کو مانتے نہیں زیادہ تو اس سلسلے میں ہم کیا کر سکتے ہیں کہ خدام الحمدیہ اور لجنا کو کوشش کرنی چاہیے جب خدام الحمدی اور لجنا کی تنظیم میں وہ شامل ہوتے ہیں لڑکیاں اور لڑکے ہیں تو وہ اپنے پروگرام ایسے بنائیں کہ ان لوگوں کو جو ماحول میں باہر ان کو آزادی مل جاتی ہے باہر آنا جانا دوستوں میں پھرنا اٹھنا بیٹھنا زیادہ ہو جاتا ہے وہ ان کے مطابق پلان بنائیں ان کو اپنے ساتھ جوڑ کے رکھیں اور اسی طرح آپ لوگ بھی صرف اپنے بڑھاپے والی سوچیں نہ رکھیں ان کے لیے ایک پلان بنائیں ایسا جو ان کو اٹریکٹ کرنے والا ہو ان کو باقاعدہ پلان دیں آپ نے بھی ایک رکھا ہوا ہے لایا عمل کہ یہ ہم نے لایا عمل بنا دیا بس اسی پہ چلنا ہے آپ اپنے ساتھ کو نوجوان نائبین شامل کریں اور ان کو کہیں نوجوانوں کو اٹریکٹ کرنے کے لیے ان کو اپنے ساتھ جوڑنے کے لیے ہیں اور اس سسٹم میں انٹیگریٹ کرنے کے لیے کس طرح ہم پلان کر سکتے ہیں خود لڑکوں سے سوال کریں جو وقفین نو ہیں جب پندرہ سال کی عمر کے ہو جاتے ہیں یا وقفات نو ہیں ان سے پوچھیں کہ کیا طریقہ ہم اختیار کر سکتے ہیں کہ تم لوگ بہتر طور پہ جماعت سے اٹیچ رہو ان سے خود سوال کریں یہ ٹھیک ہے پھر ہر ہفتے میں ہر مہینے یا مہینے دو مہینے بعد ان کا جائزہ بھی لیتے رہیں ان سے پوچھیں ان کو بلائیں ان سے ملیں کوئی نہ کوئی ان کی ایکٹیویٹیز کے سامان کریں ایسے پلان پروگرام بنائیں جس پہ وہ دلچسپی لے کے مسجد میں آئیں مسجد سے اٹیچ رکھنا اصل کام ہے ٹھیک ہے اور جیسا کہ میں نے کہا اس میں انصار اللہ اور خدا علمدہ کو بھی شامل کریں اور اپنی ٹیم کو بھی ذرا وسیع کر کے ان کے ساتھ جوڑنے کی کوشش کریں اور خود ان سے سوال کریں بچوں سے تاکہ ان میں یہ پیدا ہو کہ ہماری کو اہمیت ہے ٹھیک ہے دنیا داری صرف کوئی چیز نہیں ہے بلکہ ہم نے وقف کیا وقف کی اہمیت اگر آپ پندرہ سال کی عمر تک والدین نے تو محنت کر دی لیکن اگر آپ نے پندرہ سال کی عمر تک بچوں کے ذہنوں میں خدا علیہ نے بھی لجنا نے بھی اور آپ نے بھی یہ راسخ کر دیا کہ تم وقف نو ہو اور وقف نو کی کیا ذمہ داریاں ہیں ایک کینیڈا میں خود میں میں نے بہت ساری ذمہ داریاں بتائی تھیں کیا ذمہ داریاں ہیں وہ ہر ایک کو بتائیں ہر ایک کو یاد کرائیں ان کو پتہ ہو ہر مہینے ان کو اس کی جگالی کرتے رہیں یا دہانی کرواتے رہیں تو جب پندرہ سال کی عمر کو وہ پہنچیں گے تو ان کے ذہنوں میں بیٹھ چکا ہوگا کہ ہم کون ہیں پندرہ سال تک جو ماں باپ نے کر لیا وہ تو کر لیا آپ نے کوئی کوشش نہیں کی ہوتی زیادہ خاص سوائے اس کے کہ دو مہینے بعد یا مہینے بعد ایک اجلاس کر لیا یا ان کی ایک لسٹ بنا دی یا اجتماع کر لیا سال میں ایک دفعہ تو جب ایسی صورت حال ہے تو آپ نے دیکھنا ہے کہ بچپن سے ہی آپ نے ان کو کس طرح قابو کر لینا ہے اپنے صاحب اس طرح ہلا لینا ہے کہ وہ آپ کی آواز پھر لبیک کہیں سر ہونا قرآن شریف نے کہا ہے نا حضرت ابراہیم نے کہا تھا اس طرح ہلا لو اپنے ساتھ پرندوں کو پھر جب تمہاری آواز دو گے تمہارے پاس آئیں گے دوڑے ہو تو آپ کی آواز پہ آنے چاہیے اس طرح ہلائیں اپنے ساتھ اس طرح جوڑیں فار آر سیکنڈ کوشچن بلوڈ حضور گریسٹ ورچول ملاقات وتھ خدام ممبرز فرام کینیڈا آن دا سیکنڈ آف اکٹوبر ٹو تھاؤزینڈ ٹوینٹی ون 
a khadim had asked, how best can we discharge the duties we owe to Allah? Let's take a look at the response. I'm a post-grad student. I wanted to know what is the best way for a student to manage his obligations towards Khilafat, his family, his studies, and his physical and mental health. Your question should be that how best we can discharge the duties we owe to Allah Ta'ala. Huh? So if you discharge your duty towards Allah Ta'ala, the ultimate result of that will be that you will be discharging your duties for Khilafat as well. What does Khalifa say? That you bring change in your life, you try to be closer to Allah Ta'ala, you f offer your five daily prayers, you do Tilawat of the Holy Quran daily, you find out the commandments given in the Holy Quran and try to practice those things, find out what are the do's and don'ts in the Holy Quran and what you have to do and what, what are the things which we, you should not do. You'll have to refrain from those, right? These are your obligations. Secondly, your studies. Study as long as you are a student, you have to work hard. Your goal and objective should be to excel in your studies, as I have already said. For that, you will have to work hard. A good Russian student studies almost 12 to 13 hours a day. Do you spend that much time in your studies? If not, not that much, I try, not, but not that much. So, if not, then it means there's still a gap and you have to fill that gap. You have to work hard. The, the student who excels in his studies, he studies for 12 to 14 hours. You will have to see to it. Are you studying that much? If not, it means you are not doing justice. So, for offering your prayer, five daily prayers, you spend only two hours. If you offer nawafil, another extra one hour or 45 minutes. So, three hours, right? And your body also has the right on you. And that is, you must have some sleep. And that should be up to six hours, right? So, six plus three for prayers, nine hours. And if you are praying fervently for three hours, you're trying to pray as has been uh, commanded to us by Allah Ta'ala, then if you work for 11 hours or 10 hours, even then it will be equivalent to the, the work or study done by a non-believer for 14 hours. So you will save three hours here, right? So nine hours plus 10 hours, 19 hours, huh? plus one and a half hour for your eating and doing this and that thing. 20 hours, 30 minutes, then one hour outside games and play or any recreation. 21 hours, 30 minutes, right? And then give some time to your family, have a good chat with them, discussion and this and that thing, one hour, that is enough. 22 hours, 30 minutes. Hmm? Then, for studying, general, increasing your knowledge, general knowledge, one hour, 30 minutes to one hour. So, in this, you have to do some time management. So, if you manage your time in this way, that you will excel in your study, you will be discharging your duty towards Allah Ta'ala, and, as a result, towards Khilafat, and to your religion, to your Jumaat. And on the weekends, you give some time to your Jumaat, Qudam al work. And then at the same time, 
spend the weekend with your family members as well. Yeah? So you make a plan for five working days and weekends. So this is how you can manage and do justice, right? right? For our third question, we will turn to Nigeria. On the 25th of September, 2021, Lajna and Nasirat students were blessed with a virtual mulakat with beloved Hazur. One of the students asked, how can one deviate from sin he is addicted to? Let's take a look. My question is, how can one deviate from sins that one is addicted to? First thing is that you pray to Allah Ta'ala in your five daily prayers, that Allah Ta'ala save you from all the satanic attacks and certain things, right? You see, we are surrounded by so many bad things in the present day world. Even today, internet, television, and other social media is actually attracting us in a way which is not the right way. Quite a number of programs shown on the television or they're available in, on internet and inter social media are actually trying to deviate us from the right path, from the true teachings of Islam. And because of the, the lust and charm, we are attracted towards these things. So the first thing is that seek Allah's help. Only Allah can save us from Satan. This is why we say, "Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim." Allah Taala save us from the Satan, the acres. Then, in the five daily prayer, you fervently pray for yourself that Allah save you for for your siblings, for your family members, for the jamaat members, and this is how you can broaden your prayers so that you can not only be saving yourself, but your atmosphere as well, your environment as well, right? Mm -hmm. Then say istighfar, make it compulsory that uh, you daily do istighfar as much as you can, right? And yes. also, also try to avoid seeing the, the bad programs shown on the television or available on internet or social media. So this is how you can save yourself. And then at the same time, try to increase your religious knowledge by reading the Quran and see the, what are the commandments given in the Holy Quran write them down, that what you have to do and what you have to avoid and refrain yourself from those bad things, right? Yes, sir. And also at the same time, in the present day, Allah Ta'ala has sent the Prophet Muhammad to revive the religion of Islam, to tell us the true teachings of the Qur'an and the practices of the Holy Prophet the Hadith, right? Qur'an and Hadith. So for this, he has explained so many things in detail in his books. So whichever book is available in English, which has been translated in English, you try to read at least part of those books every day, so that in this way, you can increase your religious knowledge as well. So we have to work hard to save ourselves from the bad things and the sins of today. Otherwise, the attack of the Satan is to such an extent that with our, only, our own effort, we cannot save ourselves. We have to seek Allah's guidance, Allah's help in this regard. It's now time for question number four. On the 30th of October, 2021, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih V 
Ayyadullah Hotala Vanessa Aziz presided over a virtual mulagat with Nasirat from the UK. A young girl asked about how one can create a balance between need and want. Let's watch now. My question is, in life, how can we create a balance between need and want? You don't know your preferences? Huh? What do you, you truly need? You need, truly need is some clothing to cover yourself. If your parents are well off, you can ask them to get you better, good clothing. If they are well off, they can get you good food. Otherwise, the minimum thing is, requirement is the food a human being should need. And above that, if you say that, no, I will not take whatever is cooked here in my house, whether it is a vegetable or some dal or something, and I would like to eat nandos, otherwise I will not eat. That is not good, right? He said there should be contentment in your heart, right? If you are contented, that is the main thing. That uh, one is your requirement for your body, body nourishment, your food. For to cover yourself, your dress. To get better education, your schooling. Other than that, if you say, no, I will not go to the public school or government school, I will, if I not get admission in a private school, I will not study, that is not right. If you demand something which is beyond the, the, the capacity of your parents, is wrong. Right? So you have to be contented. For the fifth question, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih V, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asr Aziz, blessed a virtual mulaqat in Urdu on the 27th of November 2021 with Lajna Imaila from India. One of the members asked, how would one do tabligh to those that become aware we are Ahmadis and break their contact? Let's listen to the response. حضور کئی مجالس سے ممبرات یہ سوال کرتی ہیں کہ جب وہ اپنے حلقہ احباب میں تبلیغ کرتی ہیں تو پہلے تو وہ لوگ اسے دھیان سے سنتے ہیں یا پڑھتے ہیں لیکن جیسے ہی ان کو یہ معلوم ہوتا ہے کہ ہم احمدی ہیں تو ہم سے تعلق ختم کر دیتے ہیں تو ایسے میں پھر ہم تبلیغ کیسے کریں بات یہ ہے کہ ان کو پہلے نیک باتیں بتائیں ان کو اپنے ساتھ جوڑیں ایک لمبا عرصہ اپنے ساتھ ہلائیں ہیں جو قرآن شریف نے تعلیم دی ہے نا کہ پرندوں کو اپنے ساتھ ملاؤ اپنی ایسی تربیت کرو کہ وہ تمہاری طرف کھینچے آئیں چلے آئیں دوڑے آئیں تو اس طرح پہلے ان کے ساتھ تعلق قائم کریں جب تعلق قائم ہو جائے گا تو پھر وہ آپ کی باتیں بھی سنیں گی پھر جب ان کو پتہ لگ جائے گا اہم دی ہیں تو آہستہ آہستہ ان کو خود ہی احساس ہو جائے گا جنہوں نے چھوڑنا ہے وہ چھوڑ جائیں گے اور جو پھر بھی تعلق رکھیں گے وہ پھر آپ کی باتیں بھی سنیں گی زبردستی تو آپ کسی کو تبلیغ نہیں کر سکتی اور زبردستی کسی کو احمدی بھی نہیں بنایا جا سکتا اس لیے جو آئے اخلاص سے آئے وفا سے آئے اس کے لیے ایک مسلسل کوشش ہے وہ کرنی چاہیے تو ذاتی تعلق پہلے رکھیں رابطے رکھیں تو خود ہی آہستہ آہستہ جب ان کو پتہ لگ جائے گا کہ ان کی تعلیم جو یہ کہہ رہی ہیں اس پہ عمل بھی ان کا ہے اسلامی تعلیم کے مطابق یہ عمل کرتی ہیں پکی مسلمان ہیں نمازیں پڑھتی ہیں قرآن پڑھتی ہیں وہاں حضرت صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی ختم نبوت پہ یقین رکھتی ہیں اور پھر زمانے کے امام کو مانتی ہیں تو وہ توجہ پیدا ہوگی ان کی تو یہ ایک مسلسل کوشش ہے یہ ہم نے کرنی ہے یہ کہنا کہ وہ جی چھوڑ دیتی ہیں چلی جاتی ہیں ان کو ساتھ مسلسل رابطے کی ضرورت ہے اور شروع میں بتانے کی ضرورت ہی نہیں ہے بلکہ خود ہی آپ کے عمل سے ان کو پتہ لگ جانا چاہیے بتانے کی ضرورت ہی نہیں کہ آپ احمدی ہیں We'll be taking a look at questions and answers which have been taken from an article on al hakam called Answers to Everyday Issues, which is guidance that Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifatul Masih V, has given on various occasions in his written correspondence and during MTA programs. For our first letter, someone asked Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifatul Masih V, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asr al-Aziz, whether the instruction prohibiting the trimming of hair and clipping of nails 
from the first Zul Hijjah up to the slaughtering of the sacrificial animals applied exclusively to pilgrims, hujaj, or also to everyone who intended to sacrifice an animal. He also asked what the ruling was for people of a certain area who found out late about the appearance of the moon of Zul Hijjah. Huzur Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asr al-Aziz, in a letter dated the 11th of August 2020, gave the following guidance. What we learn from a hadith is that this rule is for everyone who offers sacrifice. Hence, Hadrat Umm Salama radiallahu anha narrates that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Anyone who desires to sacrifice on Eid al-Adha should not get his hair cut or nails trimmed after observing the new moon of Dhul Hijjah until the sacrificial animal has been sacrificed. On the other hand, if the people of a certain area did not realize the rising of the moon of Dhul Hijjah on the night of 29 Dhul Qada and found out about it a couple of days later, then they are bound by this command of the Holy Prophet wasallam only from the time when they realize the appearance of the moon. For the second letter, someone wrote to Hazrat the Mirul Mu'mineen, Khalifatul Masih V, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asr Aziz, and asked, were Hazrat Yahya and Hazrat Zakaria murdered or does murder denote the destruction of their message? Hazur Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asr Aziz, in a letter dated the 11th of August 2020, gave the following guidance. Just as there is a difference of opinion found in the books of history and sirah and among the views of the classical scholars regarding the murder of Hazrat Yahya and Hazrat Zakaria, peace be upon them, so is there also a difference of opinion in the Jamaat on this among the Khulafai Ahmadiyyat in light of their reasoning from the verses of the Holy Quran and their interpretation of a hadith. My view in this regard concurs with the opinion of Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu anhu. In light of the Holy Quran, the Ahadith of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the guidance given by the Promised Messiah السلام, I hold the position that the first and last Prophet of any dispensation or a Prophet about whom Allah has promised that he would safeguard him from the reach of the people cannot be killed. Apart from them, being killed is not a bad thing per se for the rest of the Prophets and it does not tarnish the honour of a Prophet because being killed is also one way of being martyred. However, being killed in a state of failure does not behove prophets. Hence, when a prophet has completed his work, then there is nothing wrong with him dying naturally or being martyred by someone else, because no one is astounded at someone's death in a state of success, and neither does the enemy rejoice in such a death. Thus, Hazrat Yahya salam and Hazrat Zakaria salam were not the first or the last prophets of any dispensation. Nor is there any promise of God Almighty mentioned somewhere about them that he would certainly safeguard them from the hands of the enemy. Moreover, we believe that when these prophets were martyred, they certainly must have fulfilled their responsibilities which Allah had entrusted to them in the best possible manner. And for our third question, Nazarat Islao Irshad Markaziya Rabba asked Hazrat Amir al Mu'mineen Khalifatul Masih V Ayyadul Hutala bin Asl Aziz about some ahadith regarding the acceptance of a father's prayer for and against his children. Hazur Ayyadul Hutala bin Asl Aziz, in a letter dated the 10th of November 2020, provided the following guidance on this issue. Both kinds of a hadith narrated in the books of hadith are correct in their own right and are serving as guides for us. In view of both types of a hadith, the consolidated view would be that a person whose prayers in favor of someone are potent with God's acceptance. His prayers against someone can also be accepted. Allah the Exalted did not say that he would accept his prayers in favor of someone but not against the person. In view of the status that Allah the Exalted has bestowed on a father, he accepts his prayers in favor of others and also hears his supplications against someone. That is why Allah the Exalted has especially stated about parents in the Holy Quran. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جُنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا Thy Lord has commanded, Worship none but Him, 
and show kindness to parents. If one of them or both of them attain old age with thee, never say unto them any word expressive of disgust, nor reproach them, but address them with excellent speech, and lower to them the wing of humility out of tenderness, and say, My Lord, have mercy on them, even as they nourished me in my childhood. Therefore, in these a hadith, the Holy Prophet wasallam advised us to take advantage of the prayers of the Father and to safeguard ourselves from his supplications against us. For our last and final letter, Hazrat the Middle Mu'mineen, Khalifat al-Masih the Fifth, Ayyad al-Hatala bin Asraziz, was asked as to why, during the Sayyi walk between the hills of Safa and Marwa, men ran while women do not, even though Hazrat Hajra ran in that place. The person asked what the wisdom was behind this. Hazur Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asrul Aziz, in a letter dated the 22nd of November 2020, gave the following reply to this question. Where, on the one hand, Sa'i is performed between Safa and Marwa on the occasion of Hajj and Umrah, in remembrance of the sacrifice of Hazrat Hajar alayhi salam and Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam, we also learn from the books of Hadith that on the occasion of Umratul Qada, in order to show the strength of the Muslims to the disbelievers of Mecca, the Holy Prophet wasallam instructed his companions to run and walk briskly with puffed out chests during the first three circumambulations of the Tawaf of the Kaaba and the Sa'i of Safa and Marwa. He also did the same because the disbelievers of Mecca believed that the Muslims who came from Medina were greatly weakened by the fever there. Therefore, according to this instruction and the action of the Holy Prophet وسلم, running in the first three circumambulations of the Tawaf of the Kaaba and during the Sa'i between Safa and Marwa became the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet وسلم, for the men performing Hajj and Umrah, given that they had the strength to do so. However, it is not necessary for those who do not have the strength to run as is evident from the response of Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, who was walking instead of running during the Sa'i because of his old age, to the objection of a person. He said, if I used to perform the Sa'i by running, then it was because I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam performing Sa'i by running. And if I am now performing the Sa'i by walking due to my old age, then it is because I also saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam performing the Sa'i by walking. According to Islamic jurists, the fuqaha running during the tawaf of the house of Allah and during the sa'i is the sunnah for men, not for women, because the satar, i.e. parda, that is mandatory for women, cannot be maintained by their running. As far as Hazrat Hajar's running in search of water is concerned, it was an emergency situation in which Hazrat Ismail salam had reached a state of dying due to intense thirst. Moreover, it is also mentioned in the narrations that in some places she would walk fast, and at times she would run. Just like one sometimes takes quick few steps and also runs out of restlessness to reach a certain place. Nevertheless, there is no such emergency for women on the occasion of Hajj and Umrah. Moreover, there are also men along with women on the occasion of Hajj and Umrah. Therefore, it is considered sufficient for women to walk at a reasonable pace on this occasion, so that they are able to follow the sunnah of Hazrat Hajar alayhi salam. That concludes another episode of Beacon of Guidance. Join us again next time for more questions and answers with our beloved Hazur. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.